shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? ...of plentiful cheap fuel with the rapid economic growth that went with it brought a comfortable lifestyle uh, to millions of people. It enabled us to travel the world and to keep warm in winter. And it brought millions out of poverty. And it generated lots of well-paying jobs. So you might ask, what was not to love about it? Well, now we understand. We understand the cost of societal decisions that were made, that were made decades ago. And people are worried. Uh, a national poll that was released three days ago uh, said that more than three quarters of Canadians identify climate change and environment as key ballot box issues. So people do care. But many of them are having trouble seeing what they regard as acceptable solutions. As a European Commission leader said a day or two ago, we're trying in half a century to reverse 150 years of economic development that was based on fossil fuels. It is possible and it is desirable, but we shouldn't be surprised that it's complicated. So what is our role as citizens in attacking this very complicated global problem? Well, if we start, we know that succumbing to despair is not a solution. Many years ago, I was talking to a government minister of environment about some environmental policies that we believe the government should be adopting. He said, yes, of course, you're right. But the public will to make those changes doesn't exist, he said. So it's your job as a citizen's organization to create the public will that will make it possible to make those changes. Well, that daunting challenge has continued to haunt me over the years. It's our job as citizens to create the public will to do what's required to preserve a livable planet. That's our job today. So you and I know what needs to happen here in Saskatchewan. We know our per capita greenhouse gas emissions are much too high. We know we have to make a transition off fossil fuels and create a different kind of economy. We know that energy efficiency and renewable energy are keys to a sustainable future. But at this point, the majority of Saskatchewan people are not demanding the necessary actions from our elected and our business leaders. So if it's our job to change that, let's think about how we can be most effective. The good news is that technically, the possibilities for meeting our energy needs without using fossil or nuclear fuels are opening up dramatically. In, in the past decade, the price of solar and wind power has dropped so much that it's now cheaper to build new electrical capacity from renewables than from coal. So the economics are beginning to work in our favor. And right now there's a real window for change. So in the campaign to maintain a planet that's fit to live in, there are many different roles to be filled by citizens like us. Some of us will focus on creating public understanding of the science and the need for good policy. In fact, of course, we all need to be able to explain to our friends and neighbors the urgency of the crisis and what's happening to our planet. 
And some of us will work within the political system and help shape those policies. Others will focus on the practical aspects of building more sustainable ways of meeting our energy needs. And yet others may concentrate on helping those fossil industry workers to make a transition to a new kind of livelihood. Some of us will have the talents to paint posters and paint signs, and I see all these wonderful signs today. Yeah. And some of us will sing songs to help keep our courage up. And all of us, I think, can provide support in all kinds of ways to those who are playing the more visible roles. And of course, each of us has a role to play in reviewing our own lifestyle choices. These are choices that not only contribute directly to reducing emissions, but that also help our friends and neighbors understand the changes that are needed. So together, all of us here today, at those at similar events around the world, we must be the change. And the change is happening. It's just that it's got to move a whole lot faster. We've come together here to build our courage. And as we walk, we can each be thinking about how we can use that courage to make a difference to the future of life on Earth. Let's think about what is my role? Let's think about who needs to be convinced. Whose mind do we want to try to change? How can we reach them? How can we each most effectively contribute to protecting the planet's future? And if we're going to succeed, it's not going to be by sinking into despair, but rather it'll be by knowing that the change is possible, that the change has started, and that we are the people who are not going to allow our home planet to be wrecked. This is the responsibility of our generations, yours and mine. So let's just get on with it. We're all going to amplify that message that you brought to us, Anne. Thank you so much. One of the groups we've got here is looking for Neil Sinclair. So Neil, if you're hearing this, please come to the Globe. You've got people looking for you. Um, I should mention, I just, to manage your expectations, so we've got a program here that lasts uh, roughly about one o'clock, and then we're going to be marching. Uh, we've got a route that we've established. We have to stick to that route, so we'll give you more details about the march that takes place, and then we'll be back here. I expect the march to be about 40 minutes. But uh, our next speaker is... Uh, a duo, we've got a duo from the medical college, Sejal and Ben, are you here today? Can you please come forward? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's territory, homeland of the Métis First Nations people. We would like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the ancestors of this place and the founders of this movement towards climate justice. So, as mentioned, my name is Sejal. And I'm Ben. And we are second year medical students from the University of Saskatchewan. So, we and our colleagues have founded a planetary health student group within the college because we believe that not enough is being done to address the climate crisis that we are in. Climate change is affecting the health of our community. I first became interested in climate change, I think I can remember it back to grade four. I started a school environmental club at my, uni or at my elementary school because I thought that we could recycle more and that we were lacking trees in our backyard. Uh, so unlike Sejal, I'm new to environmental activism. Uh, for most of my life, I lived in my own bubble. I felt safe and oblivious to what was going on in the world. I assumed that everything would be okay that our leaders would take care of the problem. And then last fall, when the IPCC released their report, I realized that our leadership was not taking the initiative they needed to. I was shaken by this realization, and I just felt hopeless. Climate grief is real. 
But we can't just sit complacent. We need to take these feelings of hopelessness and despair and channel them into real action like all of us are doing here today. So now with our schooling, we've had the chance to reflect on how climate change will impact the health of the people of Canada and the world. Uh, climate change advocacy matters to us because we can't all be full-time policymakers. We have jobs and classes and families. Among our local activists, Sejal and I had to chan the chance to speak at City Council in September to support the motion to pass the City of Saskatoon Climate Adaption and Mitigation Strategic Plan. We wanted to support this important motion because we know that climate policy decisions are health decisions. This motion was passed. This is proof that positive things are happening in certain areas, but there, there are many other things that still need to be done. So the science of this report and many others says that we are seeing trends towards, towards wetter, warmer, and wilder conditions. These trends are only going to continue to progress and worsen unless action is taken. From a health perspective, worsening allergies, asthma attacks, heat stroke, New invasive vector-borne diseases are all threats that are creeping up on us and threatening the health of our communities. Climate change is going to affect what we call social determinants of health. These are different factors that influence individuals' lives in unique ways. These factors include things like housing, food security, water security, job security, access to sufficient health care, and socioeconomic status. Water, soil, and air are the ultimate determinants of health. So caring about planetary health falls within what we need to care about as future physicians. Climate change affects the health of people in Canada and throughout the world, but climate change is inequitable, meaning that it affects most of us that have the least, often who are the least responsible. However, climate change is all-encompassing and it will affect every single living thing on this planet. The science is settled. It doesn't matter who you are, what you do, where you came from, this affects all of us. It is time to put aside the things that divide us and speak as one voice demanding a future for this planet. The time has come for change. No longer should we accept fossil fuel companies promising to cease their pollution of our planet while they build new pipelines. No longer should we accept politicians' platitudes of addressing climate change while they give oil and gas companies tax breaks and subsidies. It's time we stand up for our planet. We want to acknowledge the youth who are missing school today to fight for a brighter future. While you guys may inherit the earth tomorrow, you are acting as leaders today. And to those who are missing work or other commitments for the betterment of this planet, this could not be done without your support. And to our community advocates and to our elders who have been fighting the good fight for years, you are our inspiration. Thank you all for your presence, leadership, and activism. This fight for our future will not be easy, but as the waters are rising, so are we. Doctors get it, nurses get it, all healthcare workers get it. There is no such thing as a healthy society without a healthy environment. Thank you so much, Sejal and Ben. We appreciated those words. Now I need Catherine Green. Are you here, Catherine? Catherine is going to give us a little bit of a lesson on some of the chants we're going to be doing as we do our march later. So I'm going to turn over to Catherine and we're going to learn how to chant. All right, so um, I'm going to climb up on the flower bed so I can see you all. 
Um, I don't know if you know this, but singing together has been scientifically proven to overcome despair and to build courage, which is what we need, as Anne was saying, and it's a great antidote to, uh, to eco-anxiety. So I hope you're all going to sing along today. We have a number of chan chances for you to do that. Even if you don't think of yourself as a singer, this is your opportunity to just raise our voices together. So the first song is, is very simple. It, the words are simply, we are unstoppable, another world is possible. And I'll start singing and invite you all to join in. And you might want to move a bit too, because I know it's chilly out today. We are unstoppable, another world is possible. 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 Whoa, you guys sound awesome. That's great. This next one, I'm just going to do call and response. So I sing a line and then you sing it back to me. It's, uh, it goes like this. Climate justice is what we need. Not billionaires and corporate greed. Climate justice is what we need. Not pipelines and oily seas. Climate justice is what we need. Not fossil fuels and cutting trees. Not fossil fuels and cutting trees. Woo! Thank you. Fantastic. And I know this, the, the students have even more chants, so if you like chanting, we're going to be doing some whole lot of that as we do our marching later today. Please welcome Trudy from the Saskatoon Peace Coalition. Hi everyone, great to see such a crowd out here today. My message is a little different today, but it's all connected. Wars and crimes against humanity. Wars are crimes against the earth and its environment. I looked for information on the number of dead that were killed in war since the early 1900s, and the figures are staggering. It's in the billions. So it follows that the earth, its ecosystems, our oceans, our rainforests have been hit and damaged as well, many beyond repair. What happens in war besides horrific deaths to humans? Fires, water contamination, Windstorms, wildlife extinction, crop failures, dying marine life, and so much more. The chemical and toxic makeup of bombs leach chemicals into the soils and groundwater. Since the world wars in Vietnam, we know that hundreds of thousands of chemical agents were employed, herbicides and defoliants like Agent Orange and Napalm. Also, labs in the world have been testing for biological warfare, things like anthrax. And they, I'd like to know maybe where Ebola comes from. They're still doing it today. They're still doing this testing. They're using primates and domesticated animals and humans too. Military activities produce extensive amounts of greenhouse gases and cause resource depletion. The U.S. military is estimated to be the number one fossil fuel consumer in the world. The Pentagon's Director of Environment Safety and Occupational Health has stated that they work with approximately 39,000 contaminated sites. In Canada, the Department of National Defense readily admits it's the largest consumer of energy of the government of Canada and a consumer of, quote, high volumes of hazardous materials. Armed forces from around the world were responsible for the emissions of two-thirds of CFCs that were banned in 
the Montreal 1987 Montreal Protocol for causing damage to the ozone layer. Naval accidents during the Cold War have dropped a minimum of 50 nuclear warheads and 11 nuclear reactors in the ocean, which remain there. We should be loudly protesting our government's plans to spend billions on fighter aircraft and warships. It's something like 19 billion and 17 billion. I heard uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau say today that he wants to plant two billion trees. Well, take that money and build the trees instead of fighter planes. We're not preparing for war, are we? So these funds should go to clean the environment, green energy, and not least to the el elimination of nuclear weapons. They really don't know how they will get rid of spent radioactive material. You've heard of the Fukushima plant in Japan. Now all of those tanks are full, they don't know where to put it, and they're contemplating putting that radioactive material into the Pacific Ocean. And they are apparently, they are dumping into the Pacific Ocean, and they're saying it's treated, but it's got tritium and strontium in it, it's radioactive. And I don't think it's any action because Tourism is suffering, and the hotel. had one of the biggest economic booms in its history. Saskatoon Public Schools had to cut $5 million in spending for this upcoming year. Yet the provincial government has spent well over $5 million fighting the federal government's carbon tax in court. Shame! My class, showing although our education system took a hit, we are not rolling over and letting this pass. This needs to be changed, and this is something a youth climate committee can help address by giving youth in Saskatchewan a voice in the municipal and provincial, provincial governments. The, the Prairie Resilience Plan our provincial government has in place is said to be an alternative to the carbon tax and the, the federal government has put in place. And Saskatchewan has decided to stick to this until we know more from the Supreme Court. This plan has many positive ideas although it falls short of the Paris Climate Agreement's call to reduce emissions. The Saskatchewan Environmental Society graded this plan, and the, pro the province's overall mark was 54%. We need to be doing more. <laughs> SAS Power's recent announcement to cancel the net metering rebate and even the ability to use solar in a net metering capacity is a huge hit to the solar industry. Which is quickly on the rise here in the province. A policy like this stems from the provincial government and we as voters and future voters should all be communicating our displeasure to our representatives. The International Governmental Panel laid out that we have 10 more years to make drastic changes to how we produce energy and live or face the consequences of our inaction. Students and allies are here today to show that we are not going to stand. Okay, thank you, Glenn. So, my name is Lauren, and I'm here to talk about the importance of youth representation in all aspects of decision making. In 2016, there were 28,120 young people between the ages of 10 and 19 living in Saskatoon. This number is constantly growing and we are a population that cannot be ignored. We have grown up in a time of global change. We have felt the pressure of climate change, economic turmoil, and global tension. 
Despite this, we are not taken seriously in conversations surrounding our very livelihood. We have contributed the least to this mess and will suffer the most. In 2018, the UN declared that we have until 2030 to make massive change in order to keep our warming to moderate levels below 1.5 degrees Celsius. In 2030, I will be 26 years old. We will barely be adults, yet we will face the knowledge that we have reached the limit on a planet that does not belong to us. This should anger us. This should anger everyone. Because of this and so many other reasons, young people everywhere are taking our future into our hands. Youth leadership is everywhere. We are speaking up, contributing to the conversation, and taking charge of environmental issues we feel are not being taken seriously enough. One of the turning points in youth climate activism has of course been Greta Thunberg. She's been an inspiration for so many of us. Her movement has spread like wildfire. Today, she is nominated for Nobel Peace Prize and has spoken to countless assemblies and parliaments. She's also been a beacon uh, to those of us who are neurodiverse. She's an example of the power of individual activism and the limitless potential of youth. Just last week, we saw the power of youth when an estimated four million people took to the streets to make our voices heard on the issues that matter so much to us. <laughs> Saskatoon needs young people at the forefront of conversations about environmental policy. This is entirely possible as many communities around the world have been doing this for years. Cities like Portland, Oregon are taking action to involve youth and we need to be more like them. They have a youth climate council that meets once a week and works closely with the municipal government to ensure youth voices are heard and taken into account. <laughs> Saskatoon needs an advisory group like this one as it is our future and we need to demand a seat at the table. <laughs> this committee would tackle issues like protecting the Northeast Swale, promoting renewable energy legislature, and holding local businesses and administrations accountable for their actions. If you are joining, interested in joining such a committee, please speak up, come talk to myself or anyone else wearing a yellow armband. A Saskatoon Youth Climate Committee is the first step to having our voices heard. At the end of the day, our future is in danger and we cannot be silent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. I guess I was wrong. We actually now have two more speakers. So can I get Emma to come to the mic? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emma Sean, and I'm a junior at Bethlehem Catholic High School. I would first like to begin by recognizing the amazing speakers that spoke before me and the amazing people that have yet to speak. I would also like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, the homeland of the Métis. I am still a child. I am full of dreams, hopes, and faith. When we used to talk about what we want to be when we grew up in school, I always thought about exciting and powerful careers like being a doctor or a teacher. But I also deep down thought about the one role I knew I was being called to fulfill, being a mother. I have always loved kids and the innocence they have. I am not yet a mother and won't be for a long time. Oh, I'm sorry. Because I'm still a kid, but my rosy bubble of happiness and peace that I, that I grew up in has been popped. I used to dream about the days where I would take my children and grandchildren to see the beauty of the natural world hidden behind the trees. But now that dream has vanished, for I fear it may not happen. I fear my child will not get to breathe clean air or swim in clean waters. I am scared for my future. I'm scared for what will happen if the adults in power do not start taking some ownership and leadership. I do not want to be scared for my future. I want to be back in my rosy bubble, but unfortunately I cannot go back there because, I'm not, because if I'm not out here marching, no one will be. This is not how children should be spending their Fridays. We should be in school, but we cannot be in school unless the adults with power start listening to what we are saying. 
I want you to realize that we are all scared. You talk about making our city safe by lowering crime rates or putting up more street lights, but our city will never be safe unless we start taking action in the biggest crisis our world has ever seen, the climate crisis. We need help. We must all unite together and help save not only our planet, but also the future of coming generations. I want you all to be worried and start acting like this is a crisis. I want my future back. I want to give the future generations their future back, but I cannot do it alone. We need the adults in charge to start doing what they were elected to do so that us kids can be kids again. I would also like to quickly call upon teachers and the school boards. I do not think you realize how much power you have. Outside of a child's parents, you teach kids what is right and what is wrong. They look up to you and your ideas. All students, regardless of age, are influenced by their teachers. Teachers and the school board need to stop with the lack of support for students trying to fight for their future. You are helping mold us into good people to be released into the world. But if we don't have the support and are punished for fighting for our futures, all the work in teaching us how to be better people will have been wasted. There will be no world to release us into. Please show all the students that you care about our futures and what we will make of them and help support and teach us through this fight. Thank you. On the prairies, whether we realize it or not, already increased by two degrees centigrade, even with immediate and decisive action.